So it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker, Ginny Lee. Uh, Ginny got her PhD in Nancy Kleckner's laboratory and then got her MD at Hopkins. And she joined actually my laboratory in the 90s as a postdoctoral fellow. We were working at this point actively on axon activation and Ginny joined this project and she did spectacularly well. After only two and a half years, she already got an offer to Harvard to join the faculty at MGH. And I had to make then, a, I think, a very wise decision at this point to get out of the field of exon activation because I thought I would never be able to compete with Ginny. But anyway, she has continued very well uh, on exon activation. She's really dominating part of the field on um, the function of non-coding RNAs in epigenetics and on diseases. And she, she's also she's an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And her talk is on regulatory interactions between RNA and polycomb repressive complex two. I want to first thank uh, Rudolph for that nice introduction and also Phil and Sangeeta for the invitation to come and uh, speak at this wonderful symposium. Okay, so the first slide. Not working. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to tell you three very short stories today. The first on the role of RNA in cancer, and then turn your attention to regulatory interactions between uh, RNA and polycomb repressive complex two, and then end with a few words about the role of non-coding RNAs or long non-coding RNAs in therapeutics. Okay. So the first story is the work of um, an excellent postdoc in the lab, Ada Yildirim, who's actually on her way to Duke University to become an assistant professor together with our bioinformatician at the time, Ruzan Sadreyev, and some critical clinical colleagues, in particular David Skadden, James Kirby, and Diane Brown. Okay, so here is the famous exists long non-coding RNA. It is 17 kilobases that's transcribed only from the inactive X chromosome, and it is absolutely required for the initiation of X inactivation, which many of you know is the mechanism of dosage compensation in mammals that leads to inactivation of one X chromosome in the female. And this RNA famously coats the X chromosome, which synthesizes it, which is shown here by RNA fluorescence in situ hybridization. And then what happens thereafter is that the RNA recruits various repressive complexes to the chromosome, including polycomb repressive complex two. Okay, so although X inactivation happens essentially only, or initiates only once in development, and that's around the time of implantation, we now know that um, X inactivation indeed exists, is essential, uh, essential throughout female life. So some beautiful work from the Anish lab in the 90s showed that um, a germline deletion of exist leads to early embryonic lethality, in particular in the females. And what we recently showed is that exist is not only required to initiate that process, but also to maintain it throughout female life. Because when we conditionally deleted exist in blood, what we saw was at least a partial X reactivation and then death from a number of cancers with essentially 100% penetrance. And what this Kaplan-Meier curve shows is that female um, uh, pups start to die around two months of age, and then by the two-year mark, more than 90% of both the heterozygous and homozygous females had uh, perished, and that's in contrast to all the control litter mates. So it looks like there was initially uh, a myeloproliferative neoplasm um, with uh, ectopic hematopoiesis essentially occurring all throughout the body, including in places where normal hematopoiesis does not occur, including the uh, heart and in the pancreas. And um, the problem was that this hematopoiesis was qualitatively not normal. So uh, these mice eventually develop uh, what's called a myelodysplastic syndrome on top of this hyperproliferation uh, syndrome. And eventually, these mice will develop three specific tumors. One, a chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, which is also known as CMML, and erythroleukemia, which is a leukemia of red blood cells, 
And um, then this bizarre solid tumor called a histiocytic sarcoma, or in humans, also known as malignant histiocytosis. Uh, it is a solid tumor of blood origin, believe it or not. And these mice, um, as you can see, have widespread metastases of this uh, type of tumor to the kidney, to liver, and various other uh, organs. So it turns out that a deletion of exists caused a primary defect in hematopoietic stem cells. And this, this work with uh, David Scadden's lab, what we showed is that there is an increase in the SCA1 positive, KIT positive population of stem cells, uh, suggesting that there is an aberrant differentiation or maturation of these uh, uh, HSCs. But interestingly, at the same time, we saw a decrease in the number of these CD150 positive, CD48 negative cells, these so-called SLAM cells, which are the long-term progenitors that hang out in the bone marrow and uh, suggesting that there is an age-related loss of uh, these long-term progenitors, consistent with uh, what I didn't show you, which is a, a, a eventual bone marrow crash. And so the model here is that uh, deletion of exists causes a partial X reactivation, which leads to a series of genome-wide changes, um, then that then leads to this um, a primary defect in the hematopoietic stem cell, which uh, eventually will cause a uh, cancer called MPNMDS, with three specific manifestations, a chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, a leukemia of red blood cells, and this bizarre histiocytic sarcoma with death uh, caused eventually by um, widespread metastases and uh, tumor infiltration. And so the take-home message here is that uh, at least this is one case of long non-coding RNA, which is important for maintaining health as well as in the uh, development of disease. Okay, so then in the second part of the talk, I'd like to turn your attention to uh, some more molecular analyses, um, these regulatory interactions between long non-coding RNAs and uh, polycomb repressive complex two. So we use uh, X inactivation to study virtually everything, and that is because, at least long non-coding RNAs, and that's because uh, X inactivation uh, is regulated by a series of long non-coding RNAs, which I summarize here. So prior to the onset of X inactivation, uh, this transcription factor CTCF represses this important exist gene. And then um, what happens during the onset of inactivation is that rep A RNA will co-transcriptionally recruit PRC2 to the X inactivation center. And as long as the antisense psi X RNA is expressed, however, this complex doesn't actually load onto chromatin. And so at this time, the complex is not chippable onto the five prime end of exist. And so what that tells us in vivo is that the process of recruiting uh, PRC2 by uh, the long non-coding RNA is really uh, biologically separable from the loading step. And so it's only with the downregulation of the antisense RNA do we see chipping of um, PRC2 to the five prime end of exists and H3K27 methylation. And um, at the same time, what happens is this activator RNA called JPX is upregulated tenfold. And uh, JPX will bind to CTCF and evict CTCF from the five prime end of exists, thus derepressing the exist gene. And this uh, series of events will uh, lead to the upregulation of the full EXIST transcript shown here. And because EXIST also has a binding site called repeat A for uh, PRC2, it also takes up PRC2. And then this RNA protein complex loads onto a critical nucleation site, which is also in the EXIST gene. Um, through a transcription factor called uh, YY1, which interestingly binds only to the future inactive um, X chromosome. Okay, so then from there, uh, the nucleation site, this RNA protein complex spreads through the rest of the X chromosome to initiate the process of uh, silencing. So the take home message of the slide is that X inactivation is controlled by this complex interplay between lots of non coding RNAs and various chromatin complexes. All right, so I've already mentioned um, PRC2, but here I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, so PRC2 is the all-important epigenetic complex that trimethylates histone H3 at lysine 27. It plays uh, important roles in repressing gene expression essentially throughout um, the genome and has these critical genome-wide roles in both development and in disease. 
But there's been this uh, long-standing question in the field about how uh, the, this polycomb complex can be targeted to thousands of locations, specific locations in the genome, when none of the core subunits of PRC2 actually makes a sequence-specific DNA binding subunit. So how is it that they're finding uh, their way to the places they're supposed to go? So we were very excited a few years ago now to discover that exist and rep ARNAs, which I talked about in the last few slides, can directly bind to uh, PRC2 and target PRC2 to uh, the exon activation center via this uh, repeat A motif. And so that gave us the idea that these cis regulatory transcripts uh, might be that missing link between polycomb complexes and their targets on chromatin. Okay, so we now know that PRC2 has a large RNA interactome. Uh, so we showed a few years ago that PRC2 is at least capable of interacting with more than 9,000 transcripts in ES cells, and that we showed by uh, RIP sequencing. And then um, just in this past year, our colleagues and friends uh, from Tom Check's lab and also from Danny Reinberg's lab uh, suggested that because PRC2 is capable of interacting with so many transcripts, that PRC2 may in fact bind RNA nonspecifically and be somewhat promiscuous in the way it recognizes RNA. Okay, so uh, the, to address this question of where specificity is coming from when uh, PRC2 interacts with RNA, we began with um, some structural function uh, relationship studies to look at how various subunits of PRC2 and RNA might be working together at the molecular level. And so I'm going to tell you about the work of a superb biochemist, uh, Catherine Cifuentes uh, Rojas, who's a postdoc in the lab. Uh, together with um, Alfredo Hernandez, who's actually from C.C. Richardson's lab, and another postdoctoral fellow in the lab, uh, Kavitha Sarma. Okay, so we started with um, two known binding RNAs for PRC2, and that's the uh, REP-A uh, exists, the repeat-A motif, which is shown here, and the five prime end of hot air, which is from the Hox C locus, originally described by uh, John Rin and Howard Chang. Okay, so um, these the gel shift studies here with core PRC2 indicates that there's a range of binding affinities. So, for example, uh, REP-A is uh, very, uh, or binds PRC2 very avidly, as does uh, hot air, shown here. But by contrast, uh, our negative control RNAs, the uh, messenger RNA from E. coli maltose binding protein, as well as um, this tetrahymena uh, ribozyme P4P6, do not bind PRC2 essentially at all, at least under the conditions that we tested uh, these transcripts. So then we went on to calculate uh, dissociation constants using the standard double filter binding assay and found that um, uh, REP-A, which is shown here in blue, has a KD of uh, around 80 nanomolar, so it binds with uh, relatively high affinity. Hot air has an affinity of around uh, 90 nanomolar. Uh, whereas the antisense RNA, which I told you can serve as a competitive inhibitor for, uh, PR, or maybe I haven't mentioned that yet, as a competitive uh, inhibitor for uh, PRC2 has a somewhat lower affinity of 320 uh, nanomolar. By contrast, uh, our negative controls here, uh, MBP, maltose binding protein, in yellow, as well as uh, P4P6 uh, in green here, essentially have flat curves, and so we were, in fact, not able to calculate a dissociation constant because uh, the binding never reached saturation. Okay, and to um, further drive home the, uh, the idea of specificity, we performed a two-probe competition experiment in which we mixed equal molar amounts of uh, the specific RNA uh, REP-A together with nonspecific P4P6, and the idea being that if they really had equal affinity um, and like to bind PRC2 in the same way, that perhaps they would be shifted at the same time in uh, equal amounts. But in fact, what we saw was that uh, here REP-A by itself, of course, bound PRC2 very nicely, but when it's mixed together with equal molar amounts of P4P6, we saw that REP-A continued to shift in much the same way, whereas P4P6 uh, did absolutely nothing in the same uh, test tube. So I think this really drives home the point that PRC2 has a huge preference for the specific RNAs, REP-A, over various nonspecific uh, transcripts. Okay, so 
Uh, then another important question in the field has been, which is the RNA binding subunit of uh, PRC2? And so to address this question, Catherine purified individual subunits of PRC2 and demonstrated that EZH2 has a very high affinity uh, for RNA. And so you can see that for Rep A and uh, also for hot air, the affinity is somewhere around 20 to 30 nanomolar. And you'll notice at the same time that uh, MBP, this nonspecific transcript, has shifted up and to the left, indicating that its binding affinity for this uh, EZH2 has increased. As in this case, to about 200 to uh, 300 uh, nanomolar, suggesting that EZH2 may indeed be uh, somewhat promiscuous as uh, PRC2 goes. And so uh, SUS12 has a similar binding affinity for RNA, somewhat lower, between 100 to 200 nanomolar. And you'll notice that uh, these nonspecific transcripts are also binding SUS12 with uh, relatively uh, equal affinities. Whereas um, EED, another subunit of uh, PRC2, didn't bind RNAs essentially at all. Okay, so because EZH2 has uh, such high affinity or much higher affinity than whole PRC2, we wondered whether the addition of those other subunits of PRC2 might actually regulate uh, specificity. And so um, what this experiment shows is that indeed by adding EED to EZH2, uh, we see a significantly weakened strength of interaction between EZH2 and the RNA, uh, shifting the KD from about 30 nanomolar up to 200 uh, nanomolar. And you'll notice that MBP's curve has, again, dropped back down uh, to baseline. And the same was true when we added EED to SUS12. So that tells us that EED imparts um, a considerable specificity to the way uh, PRC2 interacts with RNA. Okay. Now, PRC2 is known to exert its repressive effects uh, in part by, um, through EZH2's histone methyltransferase activity, and because uh, EZH2 can bind RNA, we ask the logical question of whether the RNA will also regulate the histone methyltransferase activity. And interestingly, although um, RNA is recruiting PRC2 to specific regions in the genome, the presence of RNA or binding to RNA actually inhibits EZH2's histomethyltransferase activity, and that's shown here. So in the absence of Rep A RNA, the catalytic rate is around 410 nanomolar per minute, but when we add Rep A to this complex, uh, there's a threefold decrease in the uh, catalytic rate. And the inhibition is concentration dependent, which allowed us to calculate an IC50. And this IC50 correlates very nicely with the affinity of um, RNA for PRC2. So Rep A, for example, which has a very high affinity, has a low IC50 of 10, indicating that very little of this specific RNA is required to inhibit the, uh, the enzymatic activity. Whereas MBP, the nonspecific binder with a KD that's in excess of 1,000 nanomolar, um, has an IC50 of around 1,000. So it takes a lot of this nonspecific RNA to inhibit the methyltransferase. Okay, so then um, I also want to say a few words about JARID2, which some of you know is a Jumanji protein. It's a non-stoichiometric interacting protein partner for PRC2. And various labs have now shown that um, JARID2 regulates the activity of PRC2 on chromatin. And so what we wanted to know is uh, the regulatory, how does JARID2 interact with RNA and with uh, PRC2? So it turns out that, of course, JARID2 also binds RNA, but it does so with only modest affinity with the KD calculated here to be around 250 nanomolar. So it's a better binder than EED, but much worse than EZH2 or SUS12. And um, interestingly, oops, okay. So interestingly, uh, adding JARID2 to PRC2 will actually attenuate uh, the binding between RNA and PRC2. So shown here, without JARID2, blue in blue, PRC2. Uh, has a binding affinity of 80 nanomolar for RNA, but in the presence of JARID2, the affinity drops to about 220 uh, nanomolar. And importantly, by attenuating the binding of RNA to uh, PRC2, what JARID2 does is, is that it relieves the inhibition that's imposed by the RNA on the histomethyltransferase activity. 
So without Jared 2 the catalytic rate is very low, shown in blue. But in the presence of Jared 2 there's a three to four-fold increase in the enzymatic rate of, uh, of PRC2. So then, um, we suggest that the cis-acting long non-coding RNAs target PRC2 in a locus-specific manner, and that PRC2 is intrinsically capable of discriminating between specific and non-specific RNAs in vitro, and um, that even though the RNA is recruiting PRC2 to a locus, the presence of that RNA actually blocks the methyltransferase activity of EZH2 until PRC2 uh, associates with um, chromatin, uh, with, uh, associates with JARA2 on chromatin, at which time the binding of JARA2 to RNA will weaken the interaction between EZH2 and uh, with the RNA, thereby unleashing the methyltransferase activity of, uh, of EZH2. So, Graphically, we can summarize it in the following way. So here's Rep A, co-transcriptionally recruiting PRC2, targeting it to the locus. But again, the antisense RNA prevents the loading of that complex. And so I think what we can now say is that recruitment and loading and catalysis are really three separate biological events. And what we've shown in vivo is that the Cyx RNA can duplex with uh, Rep A RNA. And at the same time, it serves as a competitive inhibitor of PRC2 by directly binding to uh, PRC2 itself, both to SUS12 as well as to EZH2. Uh, and it's only when the antisense RNA disappears does this complex load onto the 5' prime end of exist, most likely in the presence of JARA2. And when JARA2 comes in contact with PRC2 and the RNA, the RNA is released or at least weakened in its interaction with uh, PRC2, and that event leads to this unleashing of the histomethyltransferase activity uh, on chromatin. Okay, so then um, in the final part of this talk, um, Phil asked me to say a few words about potential therapeutic applications of long non-coding RNAs, and I'm more than happy to do that. So we now know that this long non-coding RNA space is vast. You know, we consider LNC RNAs as a relatively new class of epigenetic regulators, though, of course, uh, long non-coding RNAs have been around for decades. And um, we believe that they uh, make excellent uh, commercial targets. Uh, so long non-coding RNAs are capable of doing a lot of things that proteins uh, are capable of doing. For example, they can either transcriptionally activate or repress uh, gene expression. But I believe that what really sets long non-coding RNAs apart from proteins are two things. One, its ability to act strictly in cis, and also um, its locus specificity. And so what I mean by that are that because long non-coding RNAs are tethered to the site of transcription, they serve as these excellent uh, allele-specific tags. So again, we have co-transcriptional recruitment of a chromatin complex like PRC2 to the axon activation center. We see that it loads while the RNA is still tethered to RNA polymerase. And then these transcripts are relatively unstable. So they uh, degrade as soon as they're transcribed, like Cyax and Re uh, Rep A, so that they don't have a chance to uh, diffuse and act at ectopic locations. But another reason for uh, long non-coding RNAs, I believe, would be its locus specificity. So long non-coding RNAs can specify a unique address in the, in the genome in a way that proteins can't because uh, transcription factors, for example, will generally recognize motifs of a few nucleotides and these motifs are replicated hundreds to thousands of times in the genome and so when a transcription factor acts, it tends to turn on or off genes all at once at a number of different locations. Whereas transcripts like REP-A or Cyax, they occur once here at the exon activation center, and so when they're expressed, they can pull uh, or repel complexes at that single location. Okay, so again, PRC2 has a large RNA interactome, and we show that there's probably more than 10,000, 20,000 transcripts that can associate with PRC2. Many appear to be locus-specific. And uh, these transcripts uh, are localized to many disease genes, and they hit in both the forward as well as the reverse strands with respect to a protein coding gene, giving us the idea a number of years ago that they could serve as excellent biomarkers and uh, therapeutic targets for disease. <clears throat> 
And so we started Rana Therapeutics, and the idea behind this company is this cis-acting long non-coding RNA that tethers polycomb complexes uh, to disease loci, and the mission is RNA activation, hence the name uh, Rana. And uh, the goal here is, is uh, the exact opposite of RNAi. Uh, so the goal is to activate genes, the good genes, that might have been epigenetically silenced by disease, such as uh, tumor suppressors and so forth. And the idea here is to block the recruitment of PRC2 using these ASOs, or antisense oligonucleotides, uh, in particular the blocking nucleotides, not the RNase H dependent Gapmer nucleotides that you heard about earlier today. So with these blocking uh, ASOs, we would uh, repel PRC2 from recruitment to these long non-coding RNAs, and hence recruitment to a specific uh, disease of a disease gene of interest. And importantly, because these transcripts act uh, in a cis-acting manner and they could be locus-specific, we believe that this would offer us the chance of achieving a sort of specificity of targeting and uh, circumvent some of the off-target or non-specific effects that plague many other uh, therapeutic modalities. Okay, so RNA activation can be applied to many different kinds of diseases. They can be applied to cancer, for example, to upregulate tumor suppressor genes. But I'm going to tell you about um, uh, one of Rana's lead programs uh, in the arena of neurological disorders. So this is spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA. It's a degenerative a motor neuron disease that causes uh, severe debilitating illness and premature death. It is autosomal recessive, it affects one in 6,000 children, and it's caused by a mutation in the SMN1 gene. And SMN1 is actually expressed all over the body, but it's exp uh, expressed especially highly in uh, the CNS or in the spinal cord. But luckily, there's been a gene duplication event in humans that gives rise to a second copy of SMN1, it's called SMN2. SMN2 has and uh, makes an identical protein, and it can actually functionally compensate for SMN1. The problem, though, being that SMN2 has a mutation in exon 7, which destabilizes or truncates and then destabilizes uh, the protein. But overall, the SMN2 gene is capable of making about 10% of the normal levels of this SMN uh, protein. So the goal then would be to upregulate expression of the second copy of SMN to therapeutic levels by targeting these long non-coding RNAs that bind PRC2 as we identified uh, them to do so by RIPSeq a number of years ago. Okay, so uh, this slide shows a number of Rana hit oligos that are capable of upregulating um, this SMN2 gene, both at the RNA level, as shown here by RT-PCR, as well as uh, at the protein level, as shown by ELISA. And I should just comment here that uh, we're currently using LNA-based um, ASOs, but uh, Rana is also testing a number of other chemistries. So the experiment here is uh, taking patient cells, treating with 30 nanomolar uh, various oligos, and harvesting cells at 48 hours. And you can see uh, uh, efficacious levels of SMN2 protein as well as um, RNAs, at least to the level of a heterozygote, who incidentally does not have uh, manifestations of disease. Okay, and this slide shows the dose-dependent as well as the durable response of SMN2 across a 12-day uh, time period. And then uh, this last data slide shows that uh, some very, uh, I would say, promising early results. So direct injection of naked um, oligos into the um, cerebral ventricular space shows, at, oh, sorry, at uh, day zero, shortly after birth, and going out to 10 days after birth, and you can see a significant upregulation of um, SMN protein uh, with the administration of these Rana oligos. And further promising early evidence indicates uh, improved motor function um, in these geotaxis assays, and that's an assay where you put mice head down on an uh, incline, and wild-type mice will slowly turn themselves around, uh, whereas uh, diseased mice will not be able to do so because they lack the motor skills. And so very early uh, results from this geotaxis assay suggest that these uh, treated, the Rana oligo-treated mice uh, do somewhat better than the control mice. 
uh, excuse me, than the, the uh, disease untreated mice. Okay, and actually this is the last data slide. Uh, Rana is, uh, has an active lead op optimization uh, effort ongoing for these SMN2 uh, oligos, and uh, quite a number of these oligos, as you can see here, uh, give rise to at least a four to seven-fold increase in SMN protein. Okay, so a lot more needs to be done. A lot more in vivo work needs to be done, uh, but the early results are somewhat promising, and I would say that the similar technology can apply to a number of other uh, therapeutic programs. And so I'll end there with um, this acknowledgement slide for all the RANA scientists that were involved in this work. Thank you. <laughs>